I believe that an engraved apology is due to the Holy Spirit from every preacher that has kept miracles out of the church. I need to hear from you right now. I maybe believe that. Yeah. It was never, if hell is real, and it is, if hell is real, imagine God. One day I got a letter from the Mormon church saying, would you preach at our youth convention? So I immediately went to my pastor at that time, Tommy Barnett. And I said, if I go and preach for the Mormons, I'm really going to get in trouble. So I'm submitting to you, my pastor, do I go and preach to the Mormons? And Tommy, he got a big grin on his face. He said, you don't realize what's going on, do you? I said, no, I don't. He said, they're letting you in. That's how you have to see it. So go. I went. And in the King James Bible, which they have been given away for years, I quoted it because I knew their stance on hell. I knew that they weren't scriptural when it came to hell and a lot of other things. But I was standing there and I told them, do you know that I'm going to read from the King James Bible, which you all believe in because you give them away on TV. And I want to quote the scariest verse about hell in the Bible. The most terrifying scripture about hell. It's not the one in Revelation, wailing, gnashing of teeth. It's not the moment of the lake of fire. The real horror of hell is seen in John 3.16. And they looked at me like some of you are looking at me. And I said, the way you can determine how bad something is, how horrendous something is, how inexplicably disastrous it is and horrifying is the price that someone is willing to pay to prevent it. What is it about hell that God the Father bankrupted heaven and gave his only begotten son? What is it about this place that meant that he had to send his son? What are you being spared by the blood of Christ? You have no idea. But I'm going to tell you this. The reason I mention that is that when I get in the tent and I've got gangbangers and atheists, I might have a bank president and a homeless drunk. It's not the will of God for them to hear the gospel in a dry tone of voice. It's not the will of God for them to hear the gospel with apology and, and abasement and leaving active ingredients out. It's not the will of God. Let me tell you that th this is how you preach the gospel. You mention the cross. You mention resurrection. You mention hell. You mention that the devil is real. You mention the justice of God and that something's going to happen. But Mario, that's not a popular message. That's not an acceptable message. Even Paul said the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who perish. But we're still supposed to preach it. The way it's written, the way we're ordered, that's how we're supposed to preach it. And we're supposed to preach it outwardly. And why then can you be effective? What do you think that signs and wonders are for? Signs and wonders will come and confirm the power of the gospel. Let me tell you. Let me tell you, when somebody in a meeting gets up out of a wheelchair, it doesn't just mean that miracles are real. It means that hell is real. I don't have time, you don't have time, and nobody has the skill. We've got many intellectuals like Jordan Peterson that bring arguments about virtue, divinity, and truth. But we are not of that ilk. That's not my job. I don't have time for that. I only have a limited exposure to audiences. And in that time, I must understand that my opinion doesn't matter. My viewpoint doesn't matter. My stories are only going to be valid if God has told me to tell them. So in that meeting and in that moment, like this one, I need you to get saved. 
There's some of you that are educators that are in this room and you're going to stand before God because you have bent, destroyed, and poisoned young minds. And to me, you're as much a criminal as the mafia. And I want you to understand something. You need to fear God. You need to feel conviction. You see, what I believe is the fully preached gospel is accompanied with signs and wonders because you cannot apologize about the cross. Let me tell you about signs and wonders and getting rid of apology. Ananias and Sapphira died in church. I'll bet you all the building fund pledges came in immediately. How many of you believe there might have been extra? <laughs> and while that is uh, in some ways a, a, a sad attempt at comedy, I want to look at you and understand this. The power of the gospel is confirmed by signs and wonders and miracles. Yeah. Yeah, let me tell you something. So what if evangelists have been corrupt? That doesn't reflect on the gift. That reflects on them. So what if some have used radio devices and faith words of knowledge? That does not stop the validity of the true nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Look at me. They are real. They are of God. And why do I speak out against people that practice false gifts? Because I love the real. Why have I been critical of certain abuses in the prophetic movement? Because we need the gift of prophecy. The prophetic gift is one of the most powerful gifts in the Bible. Jesus, Peter said in the Bible that he was in the house of Cornelius and the Spirit of God fell. He realized that he was a victim of a prophetic promise of the Old Testament. And he knew how to step aside. On the day of Pentecost, a prophecy of Joel, he told the people, this is that which was prophesied by Joel. We don't need prophets that are giving daily words like horoscopes. We don't need you chasing vain imaginations about what heaven is like. We're about to lose a country. We're about to lose our children. The prophecy and the gift of prophecy has got to be restored to what it is. The gift that Nathan had to go and rebuke David when David needed it. You have violated the laws of God and God is not going to have it anymore. And in the name of Jesus, I speak to you as a man of God to repent.